Hello, everybody. This is uh, ah, Matt Wall here, and um, I am going to be um, doing the audio version of the end of everything that um, I should have done like a year ago, but I was waiting until we got out of the desert to where it was quiet and things were where I was able to do stuff like this. So, um, I guess that's what I'll do here. Um, the uh, page here, uh, the end of everything, copyright 2019 by Matt Wall. And then it has the all rights reserved crap. Um, Zoe did the cover and the photo of me in the back of the book. Um, my website is IHateMattWall.com, and um, this first printing of The End of Everything was paid for by a crowdfunding campaign on Indiegogo, which took place from March 8th, 2020 to May 8th, 2020. Um, those dates might be off by a day or two. I do not remember. And this first printing is limited to 125 numbered copies. Um, but this is an audio version, so this will not be printed. To Zoe, I put you through hell. Thank you for being there for me. And then we have a ridiculously long table of contents. Um, so, good. A lot of these poems I haven't, um, read since putting the book together, so this is going to be kind of fun. And, um, I'm drinking some Yellowtail Shiraz. Might be pronounced Shiraz. I don't know. I don't know how that is pronounced. So basically, um, I don't know how long this is going to take, but I could get um, silly the longer this goes. All right, first poem here. Paris. The Eiffel Tower. It stands large and erect. I want to say that it looms. Looms. I wish I would have wrote it like looms, but I did not, so that is not in the poem there. But most would look and say magical, majestic, etc. There are trees down below it. They look small from where I am, like bushes but I'm sure that they are tall trees. Ah, beautiful, beautiful Paris. There is a woman. She's holding an umbrella open above her head. It's black and white, splotches like a cow, a milk cow, black and white. She has a big black bow holding back her blonde ponytail. She is wearing a slim, sleek black dress that is short, barely covering her prize. Her purse slash bag matches her dress. So do her shoes. And I look down at my feet. I'm wearing slippers. Sometimes I go out like that on accident. Today, it was on purpose. I look at my sweatshorts. There's a large hole right next to my balls from me scratching them. I'm not wearing underwear. Anyone who looks could probably see what there is to see. My hoodie is zipped up. It too is black, like the dress that the woman wears. The woman who is protected from the elements by her umbrella that looks like a cow. There are words beneath her. I can't read them. I'm a little too far away and my glasses aren't that good. I squint, hoping it will help. 
but it doesn't matter. Some asshole just blocked my view by standing between me and the greeting card display. Here at the post office, in the middle of the desert, in the middle of nowhere, in the south of California. I really like that one. All right. <clears throat> Extractor. I sit on a footrest that should be outside, inside my trailer. It's early, it's cold. The heater is on, but the heat goes outside through the seals on the window that aren't sealed. I have the extractor fan on above the stove that also sucks the warmth out, but that's not why it's on. It's on because I'm smoking a cigarette. My arm is perched up on the stove top. I keep burning it in my arm because I keep forgetting that I just boiled a kettle of water for my instant coffee. I crank my neck over and up so I can blow my smoke up the fan. I ash into an empty ravioli can. It smells. It's gross. Behind me, my wife tries to sleep. She coughs repeatedly because the smoke isn't going where it should. The fan isn't sucking the way it should. The noise is bothering her. I'm sure she wants me to turn the fan off. But she also doesn't want me... smoking in the trailer. It's too fucking cold outside. My toes are already numb. She coughed again. I feel shitty about it, but yet here I am. Still blowing smoke into the extractor fan and ashing my cig into an empty can of ravioli. <clears throat> Have a drink. Have a hit. <sighs> Madness in a 25 inch circumference. Brain is reeling. Don't know how to stop it or if I should. So many thoughts. They are competing for real estate in my gray mass. That big fucking noodle that just seems to get me in trouble by not acting when I should. Too much time thinking. It just never shuts up. How the fuck am I supposed to concentrate on anything? When this massive shit keeps fucking with me. I have to referee my thoughts. It's like a battle royal in there. Who will win? Fuck if I know. It seems to just go on forever. Oh, to be simple-minded. How nice it must be to have nothing running through that tissue. What is that like? How do people deal with that? Do they just watch TV with a smile and decide everything's okay? What the fuck do they do? Why am I not one of you? Why does this happen? Why can't I have a calm mind? Did I piss somebody off? Can't I be simple, please? I just want peace. Peace. My brain is like 10,000 trains heading for one junction with hundreds of cars to each filled with people. Noisy people who can't shut the fuck up. All on a collision course. They will die, all of them horribly, in a crash in the flames. And I will have to cipher the meanings of all the dialogue between all of them at once. I may be going mad. Huh, that was a lot better than I thought it was. Sometimes I, um, this is like some running commentary here, but sometimes I, um, impress myself. Sometimes I forget I'm reading what I wrote and I'm just like, fuck man, I feel just like that sometimes. <laughs> and then I'm like, you fucking dumbass, you wrote that, you piece of shit. Uh, good times. What do you think about that? All right. 
fog. We moved out into the desert. We did it for the vast views. We did it to get away from everyone. We did it... Car driving by, sorry. We did it to not be slaves to the bill collectors. We did it to be self-sufficient. I look out the window and the fog is so thick we can't see 20 feet away. There are no cars zooming by to move the fog up in the air. It's stagnant. I can't see across the property. I feel trapped. It's weird. There's nothing around us, I think. But for some reason, I can't shake the feeling that it's all closing in on us. What's behind the fog? Is there anything behind the fog? Is someone watching us? My breath is getting short, damn it. I shouldn't have gone off my pills. And then that happened. Whew. Let's take a little break here while this is going on. Sorry about that. The uh, dogs needed to go outside and in the dark they saw something that made them need to chase and bark and run and be crazy but it's fucking pitch black so we have no idea what the fuck they were barking at it could have been a bear a raccoon a coyote um could have been absolutely nothing sometimes a leaf will rustle in the wind and mina the little dog will bark and um, kind of go crazy, which just sets Fred off because he thinks he's the fucking sheriff. And uh, so he has to go investigate, like, Mr. Fuji. Probably, like, one person will have got that. <laughs> but that's okay. So um, I got a new pack of cigarettes out. I poured another glass of wine. And now we are on the wreck on 62. It was last month, probably. There was an accident on 62. I've seen plenty, but this one was different. There was a white coupe that had been torn in half, not from side to side, but from front to back. I had never seen anything like it. The passenger side of the car had been peeled back from front bumper to back bumper, like with a can opener. The car that hit it was a sheriff's deputy in the county SUV. Someone is going to get sued. Someone died, I'm sure. Someone will get demoted. Many tears will be shed. I've never seen anything like it. And that is a true statement. I've never seen a car look like that after a wreck. All right. Well, let me have a hit of my cigarette, and then I'll read Smoking. I'm very fanciful with my titles. <sighs> smoking. I want to quit smoking, I think. Not sure, actually. I really do like it. I always have. I started smoking in sixth grade. I used to stand out in front of the pharmacy and wait for old people to park in the handicapped spots, then get out of their car, light a cigarette, take a puff or two off of it while they walked to the door, then toss it out as they entered. I'd run over and pick it up. The filters were always soaking wet with spit and whatever fucking illness that was killing them that made them need a trip to the pharmacy in the first place. Sometimes they'd be broken, and then I'd go inside the pharmacy and steal a thing of scotch tape, tape half the cigarette, and that would be that sometimes. Uh, sometimes you would get a little buzz if you burned the tape. Then if they snubbed it out, which they did sometimes, I'm sure I looked like a starved lunatic staring at their smoke. I would need a light, so I'd either steal a lighter or go into the liquor store and beg for matches. I would say, hey, mister, 
my mom's in the car and the lighter ain't working. Can I get a book of matches? He would look out the window confused. I'm like, she's right there in the car, the white one. There's always a white car somewhere. Um, oh, that's the next line. That's so funny. Uh, there was always a white car somewhere. I'd wave out the window. Look, she's waving. Can you see her? Sometimes they want to play a ball. Please, mister. My mom gets mean when she can't smoke. Don't send me back out there without them. Puppy dog eyes. They'd eventually give in. Side note, if my mom knew I was doing that, she would have been mortified. <laughs> Um, once I found out that my friend Jeremy's mom smoked and was on, the dad wouldn't let her smoke in the house, so she smoked in the garage, and bless her heart, she had one of those giant dish ashtrays that could hold an entire carton of butts. Then I would just grab a butt out and smoke it in the garage. She smoked lights and wore red lipstick. She was a nurse. She was the first MILF I had ever met. I loved smoking hers. I would place my lips right where the lipstick marks were, like she was kissing me. Not really, but I was a kid with a wild imagination. Let me have that one. After I got into high school, smoking was a lot easier. I didn't get carded in most places. I looked older than 14. I would also buy a porno mag and a 40 ounce to try to solidify my age. For some reason, I was sure that everyone who bought smokes also bought porn and booze. Anyhow, the thing I miss most about those days was that a pack of smokes cost 80 to 88 cents. GPCs, or gutter punk cigarettes, were cheap and awesome. I remember thinking people who spent $1.50 on Marlboros were crazy. But most liquor stores you went to had singles on sale, too. They would cost anywhere from a dime to a quarter. Money was never a reason not to smoke. Now that's not the case at all. I could buy a new car for what I spend on smokes. That really gets me mad. Why the fuck is it okay for the government to tax an addictive substance? Why don't they tax coffee, chocolate, cheeseburgers, energy drinks, pizza? Because the masses would fucking revolt. Smoking is bad now, and it has been for some time. I got into it right when places were finally starting to ban smoking everywhere. I remember smoking in restaurants, malls, pool halls, bars. I know you could still I know you still can in some states, but by the time you read this, that might have gone the way of the buffalo. So I think I want to quit, but I really do enjoy it. I only want to quit because I can't believe how much it costs, not because of health reasons. I'm sure I'll be killed by things like mozzarella sticks, pizza, donuts, cheeseburgers, booze, guns, crazy people, ghosts, cars, way before I die from smoking. But what the fuck do I know? I'm not a doctor, but doctors don't know shit anyway. They are always changing their minds on shit. Remember when eggs were bad for you? Remember when they decided that they weren't? Remember when they told you that being a homosexual was an illness? Everything is fine until a medical study comes out that shows that you are two times more likely to die of boredom than masturbation. What the fuck would they do then? Oh, that was a trip down memory lane. Living off grid. People are typically hard fucking work. No shit. I really have a hard time with people. I tend to be very tolerable sometimes. I'm quiet sometimes. I let people who want to talk talk so they can hear themselves. I also do this so I can tell if there is anything that I would ever want to talk to them about. You can tell pretty quickly 
if the person who is talking at you is capable of a conversation past what they did today. Why waste time? We only live so long. Why force yourself into shitty conversations that go nowhere fast? Basically, it's like this. If I want to run outside naked brandishing a sword, I don't want to have to worry about my neighbors. Another reason, the fucking gas company. If I've been fucked by anyone more times than my wife, it's been the goddamn gas company. They up their rates to extortion levels, and there's no competition. It's a fucking scam. It's illegal, and the government does nothing at all. It's just how it is. Fuck that. So now, we don't have gas. If we need gas, I go get propane. I want to get one of those bags you shit in that turns your shit into methane. That's the way to go. Fuck the gas companies of the world. I was a slave to bills. I was a slave to leases. Right now, I'm not. I may get sick of the trade-offs, but right now, this land is mine, and that's that. I do miss the city. I miss the conveniences. But not as much as I value my life and my sanity. If it were just me, maybe I would live in a flea bag motel in the middle of the city where I could just observe other people and their lunacies. Um, but maybe I'll do that someday. Not today. I want this land here to be self-sustaining. I want this to be a place that anyone in my family can come to to decompress, relax, or hide from the cops. One day. Well, for any of those out there that know me, um, that day has come and gone. Um, we're back up the mountain now. <clears throat> I still have the land out there. Um, but it's just, it's too fucking hot in the summer. We picked a bad place, a bad place to do that. So I'm going to be paying that same fucking gas company in a little bit here. So, not happy about that but we'll see how long my sanity lasts. Because chances are, it won't take long. But let's cross our fingers. Because I would rather not go to jail anytime soon. Alright, next poem here. A slight overreaction to constant attention and sound. My head feels like it's going to explode all over these walls. Red blood and brain matter. My nerves are shot, walls closing in. I need a way out. I feel like a caged animal ready for the kill. My sanity is questioned by myself, and I'm sure by others too. But I don't care because of my pain. My skull doesn't feel attached to my body. My arms feel like someone else's. Why won't everyone leave me alone? You know how fucked I am. I know how fucked I am. Who is the real idiot here? I don't care about anything. I just want silence. I want some fucking peace and quiet. How does that make me a bad guy? I am telling you exactly what I want, what I need. You are the one keeping me from my desires, my simple wants. Death is silent, and in death, you can't distract my brain with your constant noise. One of us will have to go, and I don't mind it being me. That's some heavy shit. It's weird for me reading these because to you, when you hear these, this is just a poem. And to me, when I read them, it also is just a poem. But I remember the events that led up to the poem. So it's... um. It's quite a different experience for me um, going over these. But I'm hoping I'm in a healthy enough place to where I can do this. 
and have it not um, send me reeling like a madman into some fucking suicide by cop scenario. All right. The worst day of the month. It's one of the worst days of the month, the day before your food stamps kick in. I don't understand. I used to always have to go the day before to use up the last 50 or something. Afraid that if there was a surplus, they'd dock me the next month. How do these work? I don't think I'm eating any different. Maybe more soup. I wish I just made my own soup. I just poured the last of my instant coffee into my cup. Damn. I will have to go another 14 hours without coffee. I can do it. I have to do it. It's December, so everything is tight. Money I would normally get, I don't. Things that usually sell, don't. People are spending money on others instead of themselves, especially not me. I found a box of stuffing three days ago. Ate through that, or ate that throughout the day. Then I found a small box of Jiffy Cornbread mix. Didn't have milk or eggs for it. Just put a little water in the mix and cooked and burned it in the pan. Ate that two days ago. Yesterday, I found and ate two cans of chili. I was farting all night. My stomach has been killing me. I need to shit, but for some reason the back door is closed and it will not open. I feel bloated. A blockage? Could I have a blockage? I don't know how that works. I just poured the hot water from the kettle into my last cup of coffee. I did it while I was sitting down. I spilt the water. It was hot and steaming. It burned my leg. It still hurts. Today, I found a box of flavored rice. I cooked that, slowly running out of propane. Fifteen minutes? Are they crazy? Don't they know that propane costs money, for fuck's sake? I'll put less water in. I'll cook it on a lower heat. No butter. I think I have a soy sauce packet. Does that go with four cheese blend? I don't care. I'm hungry. Rice and coffee for breakfast. 14 hours remaining. Once I get the stamps, I'm sure I'll waste it on chips and nuts or some shit. Maybe some jerky. I would trade it all for some cigarettes and some booze that could go down fast and help me fucking sleep. I haven't slept through the night in weeks. Jesus. I can't believe that I'm just bitching. I should stop now. I should say something poetic and wise. Here you go. Don't take any advice from anyone ever. And in case you were wondering, um, this is not part of the poem, but um, soy sauce does not go well with four cheese blend. Just a little tip for the future there for you. <sighs> Good times. The most beautiful song in the world. I had IEHP, Inland Empire Health Plan. It is basically Medi-Cal, but not everyone has to accept it, so it's shit. When I call them, the really happy bitch who's, who is a recording tells me a bunch of shit that, that I already know. Then she says... Some of our menu items have changed. Bullshit. They don't change. They just want you to listen to the whole fucking thing. It frees up the lines the longer you wait. Every place says that. And I never thought to myself, Ooh, that's different. Or, Oh, it's a good thing I didn't push one a few minutes ago. It's a scam. But, when you get put on hold, this most wonderful song plays... It swells. It has reverb on the percussion. It takes you on a journey, adding instruments. It's a peaceful journey. 
I have sat on hold for over an hour just so I could hear the whole thing from beginning to end. I don't think it's just San Bernardino County. I think it's all of California. I remember hearing that song when I lived in L.A. I often think about the guy, the guy that wrote it. I wonder how much he got paid. Does he get royalties? Hundreds, if not thousands of people hear that song every day. It never goes out of fashion. It has been the hold music for years. That guy should be filthy fucking rich. Then, when I get transferred to behavior, behavior, well, oh my gosh, let's try that. Then, when I get transferred to behavior, <laughs> oh my fucking god, behavioral health, the most awful music comes on. It pulses because there is too much low end for the phone it crackles it's awful i screamed to my wife if they keep crazy people on hold listening to this shit people will fucking go on a murder spree she says she kind of likes it i'm gonna fucking kill someone i scream the poor receptionists that have to deal with people after that onslaught of shit that assault on their ears, those poor, poor receptionists. Oh, that's the end of it, yeah. Behavioral, 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 behavioral. That's a fucked word, guys, let me just tell you. Whew. That was a fucking train wreck. I will make a note that I don't know how to say behavioral. So, that will probably be a poem that I don't read at readings. I'm glad you guys are having a good time. Yeah. Alright, Suicides for Christmas. Oh shit. Saw the second line here and I got kind of scared. All right, suicides for Christmas. The woman on the phone said, Behavioral Health Center. <laughs> yes, I said. I'm really fucked up. I need to see a doctor. I'm afraid we don't have anything. No, listen, I'm super down right now. I need to see someone. Uh, we could put you on the list, she said. The list? What the, what the hell is that? The waiting list, she said. Waiting list? How long is that? We're about... There was a long pause. Three months behind. Three months, I shouted. You gotta be fucking kidding me. Sir, please don't use that language with me. Who am I calling? The woman stuttered. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. This is the Behavioral Health Center. Good, because my fucking behavior is in bad health and I need to fucking see somebody. Uh, sir, it'll be at least three months. But in three months, I might be fine. I might not need to talk to anyone. Then everything would have worked out fine, she said. This is crap, I said. It gets very busy this time of year, she said. Well, what if I told you I was going to fucking kill myself? There was a long silence. Sir? Yes? Are you going to kill yourself? No. Then it'll be three months. But people need help now. I'm people. You know how it is with the holidays coming. Christmas, you know. It gets very busy this time of year, she said. Well, I'll cross my fingers for some fucking suicides. What? She gasped. Suicides, I said. If people kill themselves, spots will open up, right? She cleared her throat. Uh, well, I suppose... Then let's hope for some fucking suicides. I hung up, lit a cigarette. I was mad at the system, but I felt I won a small victory. Minutes later, I cried, then crossed my fingers. Alright, I'm back, guys. 
the committee. The committee was in session. I stood before them. I felt shame. I always felt shame there. It was me and them. This time was different, though. This time, there was another person there. A man with a cleaver. He was fat and dirty and wore a white apron covered in blood and shit, and he was bald. Had a couple days' growth on his jaw. Half cigar burned. Clenched in his yellow teeth. He grunted. I looked at the committee. There seemed to be four of them, but there may have been more behind them in the shadows. A woman with white curly hair spoke. You have been found guilty again. I know, I said. Place your hand on the cutting board. I looked and there was an oak cutting board on an old tree stump before me. Why, I asked. The committee has decided that you will lose a finger. What? I panicked. Which one? I gasped. Your pinky will do just fine. Why? I cried. You will make no more promises to anyone, she said. My hand went on the cutting board and the cleaver came down. My pinky was no longer mine. Blood slowly pooled beneath. Now for your ring finger, she said. My ring finger? Yes, you will no longer be wed. The cleaver came down. The thwack on the wood was louder than the crunch of the bone. And now for your pointer finger, she said. But why, I asked. So you can never point and blame anyone else for your mistakes. You can't be serious, I whimpered. She was. The cleaver came down. Jesus Christ, I yelled. Stop already, I pleaded. Why, she asked. Let me keep my thumb. Why? Because it looks like a fat little cock. What? She screamed, pounding her gavel on the bench. I mean, so I can let people know that I'm okay. I forced a toothy grin that probably looked more menacing than I hoped. She conferred with the committee. Minutes passed. Okay, you may keep your thumb. I sighed in relief. She continued, but the middle finger must be cut off. No, this can't be happening. They took my wife. They filled me with guilt. My soul is now so tiny in the shell that is much too large. You can't take my middle finger. And why not? We are the committee. Because if you take it, I wouldn't be able to say fuck you without any words. Rage filled in her eyes. Rage was burning in the other committee members. Pain raced through my body. I grabbed my wrist, looking at my bloody hand, and saw three little nubs growing out of the wounds that the cleaver left. They grew and grew. Soon they were as long as my middle finger. I had four middle fingers now. I smiled. All at once, I flipped everyone in the committee off with four middle fingers. They exploded into flames. They shrieked. The cigar fell out of the cleaver man's mouth. He stumbled backwards. I flashed all four. He vaporized into nothing. I picked up my old fingers and put them in my pocket. I nodded with a smirk, looking at the devastation that I had caused. I lifted my hand extended my cock-shaped thumb, and walked away into the darkness. Mm -hmm. 
Now this next one. I feel like I need to preface this with some important background information. Um, this next poem is called The Old Man in the Quitters. Apparently, not everyone knows what quitters are. And um, I found that amusing because I thought that was just one of those things like, um, I don't know, like um, floods or bell bottoms or... Uh, I don't know, a puka shell necklace. Um, but after the book came out, um, it became clear to me through um, talking with Zoe or getting emails from people that not everyone knows what quitters are. So, what quitters are... Um, it's when you have a pair of socks and there's just no elastic in them anymore and they just kind of like fall down to your ankle and bunch up and they're just like, uh, basically they're socks that need to be thrown out that no one throws out and they just bunch up like leg warmers in an 80s movie around your ankle. All right. The Old Man and the Quitters. It was still early in December. There shouldn't have been a line at the post office, but there was. It wasn't a long line, just a couple guys before me. But the guy at the front was buying a P.O. box. The lady behind the counter couldn't find the keys. Shit, I thought. Christmas music was playing. It was making me sick. Then one of the guys in line started whistling. But it was very breathy. Very few notes were made. Just so you know, this is what it sounds like. Like, <laughs> that was his whistling. Um, uh, at first I thought he was whistling to the Christmas music, but after about a minute I couldn't tell what the fuck he was whistling. Everyone in there was old. The second guy in line was leaning on a cane. I thought he would fall over any minute. The third guy was the whistler. He wouldn't shut up. He had on a pair of the dirtiest quitters I'd ever seen. The next guy went up to the counter. He was expecting a package, but it didn't come, and he had no tracking for it. He was sure it should have come. The lady behind the counter didn't know what to do, what to say. The whistler stopped whistling and then started singing, singing in a booming operatic voice, but wasn't saying words, just sounds, full of vibrato. I was getting angry. He wouldn't shut up. I looked down and my fists were bald. I was tapping my foot, not in rhythm, but almost like a countdown to blast off before I broke every fucking tooth left in that fat old man's head. I'm getting all upset right now thinking about it. Um... The man with the cane finally left empty-handed, which meant the noise box was now at the counter. The noises stopped. You know what that motherfucker did now? Whispered to the clerk. She couldn't hear him. She had to lean in closer. He whispered even quieter. For fuck's sake, I shouted. No one paid me any attention. He just pointed to a stamp. The lady knew what he wanted. Thank fuck! I yelled. She gave him the total. He pointed to the card machine. She nodded. He put it in, waited, then pulled it out. An alarm went off. Then he said the only thing I heard him say, Did I mess it up? I shouted at him, Of course you did! Now I needed a piss. And this fucker and his quitters never learned how to pay with a fucking credit card. This went on two more times. I was huffing and puffing. The Christmas music was getting louder and louder. Then he was gone. It was my turn. I walked up. The woman said hello with a smile. I handed her an envelope. I said, hi, you put this in my box by mistake. She laughed. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Um, just so you know, the singing, he he goes like this. He goes, he goes, oh, 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 oh. Um, uh, 
Um, I, I've seen that fucker at the post office like five or six times. And he's always in quitters. And he's always fucking singing. And when the mask stuff went down, um, I, I wouldn't recognize him at first. Um, and the whistling didn't happen when the mask was on. But he would still sometimes sing. And it's just like, Jesus fucking Christ. All right. Like, a dude can only take so much, you know, when everything's happening all at once. All right. Nut roll. I rolled a nut, I screamed. You rolled a nut, she asked? Yes, I rolled a ball. I was in agony. I had parked the car in the Walmart parking lot. When I got out, my thigh slid over a testicle and smashed it onto the seat. Oh, Jesus, here comes the stomachache. My wife rolled her eyes. This wouldn't happen if you wore underwear. Through my clenched teeth, I said, underwear is a scam perpetrated by the cotton industry to trick people into wearing two outfits at once. It is not, she said. Oh, God, I was short of breath. You are either sitting on those things or smashing those things. Underwear keeps them in place. What place, I growled. Away from harm. Bullshit. Balls hang free. That's why they're in a sack, not inside you or protected by bone. That's stupid, she said. She was right about me always hurting them. It happens quite frequently. What the hell am I supposed to do? I got big balls. They're so big it makes my cock look tiny in comparison. Instead of a twig and berries, I have a twig and avocados. The nausea moved up into my diaphragm. In just a few minutes, everything will be back to normal. Except for that tender nut. I can live with that. All right. Ah. <sighs> Beer shit and smoke. I was making a cup of instant coffee in the trailer after drinking a case of Natty Ice the night before. I felt the drop, the drop where everything that was up past your colon has decided to knock on the door, ring the rectum doorbell. Didn't have time to finish my coffee. I ran into the bathroom, shut the door, opened the ceiling vent, flicked on the small fan, filled the toilet with water, dropped my pants, and it was through the threshold before my ass hit the seat. It was awful. It was like my ass was projectile vomiting. The sound was like groans from hell. The smell was sickening, sweet, and rancid. I shoved a towel under the door with my foot, not wanting to wake my wife with the aroma. I lit a cigarette to kill the smell, so I wouldn't have to puke in the tub. After another three or four heaves, my ass calmed down. I thought it was over, but wanted to be sure. I looked at my half-burned smoke was going to rest it on the sink, but pulled my balls aside and dropped the cigarette into the bowl so I could wipe. What a mess. I was on my third handful of teepee. I thought I smelled smoke, different from my cigarette. I try to keep those thoughts out of my head. It makes me think I'm having a stroke. But then something happened. I felt something lick. Something warm licked my balls. I smelled hair burning. I spread my legs and looked down. My shit was in flames. I jumped off the toilet, all my ass hair burnt, nuts roasted. It seemed that I had made an island of shit in the water, and when I dropped my cigarette in, it landed filter first and stood like a palm tree, burning. And when I dropped the paper, the thin one-ply paper, it caught easily. 
With a crack full of shit still, I stomped the flush foot pedal repeatedly, but my island didn't want to sink. What the quakes did do was shoot up burning embers into the air, falling like snow all over the small bathroom. Burning towels in the rug. I slammed my foot down over and over. Finally, the shit, the smoke, the flames were gone. My shitty crack and the horrible smell remained. <clears throat> wow. Now you guys know a lot about me. I'm going to pour some more wine here. Dogs are barking. I'm going to finish this cigarette here. If I could get the ash off of it. There we go. All right. I think I'm doing good. I don't think I'm slurring too much yet. <clears throat> Welcome packet. I was finally able to get into the shrink's office, not with an appointment. They wouldn't give me one until I filled out the welcome packet. I headed down there. It was a long drive and the address was wrong. I needed to call them back from a road to find it. I found the building. It was roommate. This building had two roommates, of course. I picked the one upstairs first. It was the wrong one. The other roommate was on the first floor. I went inside and found a woman in her early 20s. She was about seven feet tall, long hair that was highlighted poorly with blonde streaks. She looked like she had played a lot of softball. She was nice. She was also the woman I had screamed at on the phone the last few times I called. She asked if I wanted to take the welcome pack home because it was very lengthy. How lengthy could it be, I thought. No, I said. I'll just finish it here and get my appointment. She gave me a clipboard. She handed me a pen that had a giant flower stuck to it. The paperwork was ridiculous. It wanted to know every doctor I had ever seen, when I've seen them, how long I saw them, their address, what meds I was on, which ones I was off, how long, etc. One question asked, why I was there? Why the fuck does anyone go to a shrink? Another question was, what made you come in today? I had to in order to get an appointment. Then all the do you want to hurt yourself questions asked a million different ways to make sure you were not a threat to yourself or others. Then all the crap about late fees, misappointments, fines, fees, etc. This thing took forever to fill out. I couldn't sit down because I was wearing my short shorts with no underwear. And I didn't want to show the softball player my softballs. By the time I was finished, I was very mad, but very tired. The woman was nice. She gave me an appointment for the next week. She told me to take care, and I wondered if I could hold on that long. The face in the hot sauce. A few nights ago, horribly drunk, smoking up the extractor fan, I saw a hot sauce packet on the back of the stove. Couldn't place how it got there, didn't remember it. I stared and stared. Then I saw the face on the packet. Not printed on the packet, but on the back, the white side. The face appeared on the packet. It was a man with deep-set eyes, large brow, high cheekbones, broad nose, huge full mustache, long hair sweeping under his chin, majestic, like he was on top of a great mountain. I sighed and passed out. 
the next night on pills, checked to see if he was still there. He was. I went to sleep. The third night, I sobered up. I thought for sure he wouldn't be there, but he was, looking at me, into my soul, with those fiery eyes. What are you doing here, I asked. I don't know, he said. It's Christmas Eve, I said. Don't you have anywhere to go? No, he said. I don't understand, I said. You are the one talking to a hot sauce packet, he said. I think you need someone to talk to. I made a drink. Okay, I said. Lay it on me, he said. I don't feel like I deserve happiness. I feel like I've ruined everyone's Christmas. I feel cursed, forever cursed, with crushing guilt without understanding why. He said, you haven't changed your clothes in four days. I looked down at my clothes and he was right. Should I change, I asked. Take a shower first, he said. That will make me feel better? No, but it's a start. Will it make me stop crying all the time? No. I took another drink and said, I feel like we should have had this talk four days ago. Pancakes. Everyone wanted pancakes the day after Christmas. There was an IHOP about 30 minutes away. Yes, that was the closest place to get pancakes. We walked out of the trailer and saw that it was cloudy, thought nothing of it. As we drove down the dirt road, it seemed that it had rained. The main dirt road had a small river running through it. I thought it strange. Further down the 247, we saw snow on the ground. Snow on the ground in the fucking desert. Not just a dusting, but a couple feet of snow. Then we hit it, and we hit it hard. We could barely see out the windshield. It was just quiet whiteness. When we got to IHOP, I nearly slid my car into another on the ice in the parking lot. We were told that we could be seated, but food would take an hour. We wanted pancakes. We waited. We watched the snow fall slowly out the window. It was beautiful to watch, but I was thinking of the road back the whole time. After we ate, we were almost double charged and forgot to leave a tip. Feet soaked with snow. We headed back, only to find that we were completely stopped. Snow falling, gas running low. We crawled inch by awful inch for two hours. Then a man in a reflective yellow coat. You will have to turn around, he said. Fuck that, I said. I just leave, I live a few miles up the road. He shook his head. Road's closed. How do we get home? You'll have to find another way. You couldn't have wiped the smugness off his fucked face with a weed whacker, the fucker. We took a smaller road around, then jumped on the next street before getting back on the supposed closed highway. It took us four hours to drive less than ten miles. When we got home, I opened the car door, told everyone to look away, pulled out my dick, and pissed for what seemed like a very long time. <sighs> the forward pump. Out here in the desert, you get a lot of people filling up gas cans at the pumps. 
people come out here to dirt bike, ATV, and a bunch of other abbreviations that I know nothing about. When I pulled in to get gas today, there was a man filling a can at the forward pump. I stopped at the first pump and went inside. While I was paying, some cocksucker in a big white truck started laying on his horn. I looked to the forward pump. It was empty. Plenty of room to go around. He laid on the fucking horn like he was about to nut on himself. I walked out with my box of wine and cigarettes. He looked at me and shook his head. I still gotta get gas, I yelled at him. He muttered something under his breath. I shouted, Fucker, I still have to get gas! He waited. Unbelievable. We locked on each other's eyes for some time. Then a guy came up and started chatting with him. Old friends. I got my gas, pulled away before packing my smokes. Because I'm a fucking gentleman. The motherfucker didn't move an inch. He sat in his big white truck, jaw flapping his dick liquor. I waited. I parked alongside of him watching. I packed my cigs, then took an awkward pull from the box of Merlot. I smoked an entire cigarette. It was a Camel Blue 99. That's a seven minute smoke. Easy. This boneheaded piece of shit after all that just sat in his big white truck gabbing with this guy like two old biddies and a stitching bitch. I took another drag off the wine, lit another smoke, and headed home to write this shit down. Another thing. Why do guys have to have big, giant trucks? What is the fucking point? A truck is a fucking truck. I like little cars. I wanted a Fiat forever. My wife thinks I couldn't fit in one. She thinks they need to make a new model just for me and call it the fatty. Alrighty. Therapy session one. I got there an hour early. I don't know why. The clock scares me. I need to always beat it. It never stops. It doesn't take a break. So neither can I. I walked in at a quarter till. I realized then that I really needed a piss. Do I ask? Do I wait? Should I hold it? Would my therapy be shit if I'm constantly thinking about taking a piss? I began to panic. Then a door to my right opened and a small woman walked out. She went to the counter and made her next appointment. Then out of the corner of my eye, I saw another woman walk out. She walked past me quickly and entered a room down the hall. When she entered the dark room, she flicked the switch and turned on the light. A fan came on. That was the bathroom. Now I knew where it was, thank heavens. Now I can take my piss before my session and not worry about needing a piss or not. Minutes passed and the woman came out. She walked right by me and back into the room to my right. Shit. Was she my therapist? What if she was in there... She took a major shit, a super stinky beer shit or something. If I go in there and it stinks, will I be thinking that the whole time? That this woman that I'm pouring my soul out to just took a super stinky shit? Horrible images and visions passed through my brain. Things of what I may see in there. My bladder was about to explode. I needed to risk the stink. I needed this liquid waste out of my body so I could think. I leaned forward to get up, and the door to my right opened once more. It was her. She said, Matt, come on in. Fuck. Should I say, let me piss real quick? Then she would know that I smelled her stink. Then the whole time, she would be concentrating... She wouldn't be concentrating on anything I say. She'd be thinking to herself, that man just smelled my stinky shit. He's thinking of me on the toilet. How can I empathize with this guy when he's thinking horrible things about me? Those are the things I thought. Th that she thought. This was going to be a disaster. I need to piss. Fuck it. I'll push through the pain. 55 minutes later, I had cried repeatedly. I had made another appointment, bladder trying to kill me. 
I thought about using their bathroom, but what if it smelled? I drove home in agony. <sighs> Wise words from Buddha. I used to have the body of a god. Now the joke is, the body of a god that I have is Buddha. That's fucking mean. You know how I had that great body? I smoked two packs a day and fucked like a rabbit. Want to know how I gained all the weight? I quit smoking and fucking for four years to better myself. Now, years and years later, I'm back to smoking two packs a day and fuck quite a bit. Not as much as I would like. What did that four-year sabbatical do for me? Nothing. It actually caused me a ton of problems. But that is a bitch for a different day. Now I have high blood pressure and my joints ache all the fucking time. My cholesterol is good, knock on wood. My heart seems to be okay, knock on wood. Now I'm older and fatter, gained most of the weight during the bettering. The moral? Bettering yourself will just make you fat. You will be buttering yourself. Don't take away your vices. Your body will fuck you for it. It will always fill that need with other things. That's why people in AA fuck all the time. That's why people in SA do coke and speed. And it's why people in NA find God in coffee. Let yourself be. <sighs> Rats in the engine. It's been a cold winter. Wood rats have been living inside my car's engine. They ate all the paperwork in the glove box, tore through every piece of trash I left in the car. A few months back, they ate the wires in the transmission. A $12 part costs $100 to fix. We parked the car with the hood up to make sure that it cools off and so that it isn't enclosed. But it's been windy, 40 mile an hour winds. We left it shut. Days went by. I started the car, turned on the heater, and the most god-awful rancid smell beat down upon me. I thought it would go away if I drove a bit. It got worse. I stopped and opened the hood. Splatter everywhere. Scratch marks in the underside of the hood. The bastard clawed and clawed, trying to escape. Probably fell in the fan. Felt sorry for the guy. I felt as though I too have been clawing and clawing, trying to escape. Trying not to get burned by the engine. Trying not to be sliced into a million pieces by the metal blades of the fan. I wanted to cry for the little guy, but I was dry from crying for myself. The guy just wanted what we all want. A nice, warm, safe place. A place to stay out of the cold. To be protected from predators. But it's a cold, fucking, cutthroat world we live in. Nobody really cares. It's been a couple of months, and I can still smell him. <sighs> Therapy Session 1.5 after my session, the receptionist wanted me to make another appointment. I remember my therapist saying she wouldn't be back till next year, but the receptionist wanted to schedule me for 1231 at 4 p.m. Were they testing me? I don't know what to say. I still needed a piss. I just nodded. I was afraid the therapist was secretly listening to find out if I cared for her personal space. 
I didn't know what to do. Finally, the receptionist gave me an appointment card. The next day, I kept thinking I should call and reschedule. Maybe just for earlier in the day. Maybe she has shit to do. Who wants to go to work? I can't figure out how anyone can go to work, let alone the night before a holiday. Maybe I should do something. I was beside myself. Then I saw I had a voicemail. It was from the doctor's office. Shit. I'm in it now. I didn't want to listen to it. What if my therapist is mad? What if she won't see me anymore? I'd have to find someone else, wait three months, then have to fill all that paperwork out again and tell them my life story again. Jesus, help me. I listened to the voicemail. I held my breath. It was the receptionist informing me that she screwed up and that my therapist wouldn't be into the office until January 7th. Thank fuck for that. I took a deep breath. I was exhausted. I laid down in the desert sand and fell asleep. Dude, my dogs need to piss more than I did in those poems, man. They've been out like three times since we started this thing. And I'm still on my first take for everything. It's not like I'm going back and forth, man. Just these dogs, man. All right. The end of the decade. I woke up late on New Year's Eve. Had to go to the bank. The bank is 45 minutes away in Apple Valley. It's a long drive. It was longer today for some reason. There are people everywhere hauling their trailers behind them. RVs, dirt bikes, dune buggies, etc. Everyone is driving slow. Don't they know what I have to do today? The traffic slowed to a crawl once I got in front of Green Books. I still had another half mile to go, and now I could get there faster if I walked. It had been a while since I had a check to deposit. Money comes at weird times. Most of those times I never expect it. I opened the P.O. box and it's there. That reminds me, I have to go pay the fee for my box. Today's the last day. Shit. I got to the bank, deposited my check, got back into the car, tried some back road route. It was slower. I hung my head, lit a smoke, and drove. My gas light came on. That was okay. I had the gas can in the back, too. I needed to fill that up for the generator. I also needed to fill the extra propane tank. So I wouldn't freeze to death tonight. I got to the gas station just as my car started to sputter. I pulled to the forward pump, out of order. So I backed up to the first pump. I went inside and put 50 on 5. Put 35 in my car tank. Then yet another asshole in a big truck pulled up behind me and waited. Jesus fucking Christ. Why won't these trucks leave me alone? There are other pumps. Why wait? I got the can out of the back and put the other $15 worth in it. Then sped away angrily. I was going to get my propane there too, but that guy pissed me right off. Now I had to go back towards home, but not to home. I had to pass it by another 20 minutes to get to the post office. But that 20 minutes turned into 40. I was behind a huge big rig. It was hauling a thing that I guess was a rock, but it looked like a giant piece of styrofoam. I couldn't tell what it was. I looked ahead of the truck once he hit a bend in the road, and there were many, many trucks. Pulling RVs, dirt bikes, dune buggies, etc. I dared not pass. I didn't feel like dying today. I had just deposited a check. So much time went by slowly. I got to the post office and paid my tab, $61. 
Then I had to drive another 10 minutes further from my place to get the damn propane that I should have gotten before. There were many motorhomes gassing up. Why are all these people out today? It's New Year's fucking Eve. Go to a party or something. I got the propane filled, got a bottle of Cab Sav. Then I thought I should eat some pizza with my wine. I went to the pizza place next door. There were guys in there talking. I waited for my pizza and listened. They were talking about the girl, the girl who hit me up next to the water machine. The one who said someone was trying to kill her. They said she was crazy. They said no one had seen her in months. They thought that weird, since they had the jewelry people drive her to Palm Desert and leave her there, for her just to show back up two days later. They told her they would call the cops if she ever showed up again. So that's what happened to her. The jewelry people. Where the fuck have they been? I haven't seen them in months. I should find out. Anyhow, I'm back at the homestead. The Jenny is purring loudly. The wine is flowing. Zoe is drawing a picture of Fred and Mina, and I'm typing this out. Happy New Year. A look into the future. I finally got to see a doctor. I had been waiting for almost two months. When I got there, the amount of paperwork I had to fill out was truly disgusting. There was so much of it, I would flip a page, and it seemed that the other pages would multiply. The stack seemed to get bigger each time I killed the page before it. I thought I would scream... People kept coming in the waiting room. They would sign in. Seconds later, they would be called in, and my paperwork kept procreating. I was finally taken into an exam room. There was a chart showing all the muscles in your body that you could sprain. What's the fucking point, I thought. We are so fragile. We, as humans, are a sad joke. We shouldn't be able to survive. When I talk to an evolutionist, I wonder how they think that we are the fittest. How could we have evolved into this? We should all be dead at birth. How the hell have we been able to survive? The man said he liked my beard. That grounded me into reality. He said he couldn't grow one like mine. He was only 19. You're not my fucking doctor, are you? I asked. No, 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 no. Okay, then. He asked if I smoked. I said I did. He asked if I drank coffee. I said that I did. Why do you do that to your heart, bro? He asked. How the fuck should I know, I thought. I shrugged. He said, it's cool, man. I know how you be. What the fuck is going on, I thought. Then he asked if I was straight. I told him I was. He told me to smoke some pot. I told him I would. He talked about burning his throat. I couldn't listen to him. I didn't know what the fuck was happening. Where is the fucking doctor? The doctor came in. Good bedside banner. Talked calmly. He wanted tests. He wanted x-rays. He wanted it all. I went to the lab. It was a small indoor mall. I was the only person walking through it. It felt like the world had ended. I was the Omega Man. I didn't know how that could have happened. I should have been dead long ago. I walked into the lab, and the first thing I saw in the waiting room was me. Me! But not now, in the future. How long, I couldn't tell you. I was sitting there. I was wearing the same shorts I had on now. I was wearing the same black tank top that I had on now. My beard was the same length, but was now snowy white. My tattoos were a little faded, and I was leaning onto the handle of an oxygen tank with tubes up my nose. The cigarettes had finally got me, the bastards. How dare them? After all the money I put into them, how could they treat me that way? I left. 
I couldn't do the labs. My doctor would just have to look at me and guess. I found out that I get a little fatter, have trouble breathing in the future. I will tell my doctor that and see what he can do to stop the inevitable. Therapy session two. Because it's a new year, I had to fill out insurance paperwork when I walked in. I thought that the Amazon behind the counter seemed too chipper. She walked out again and into the bathroom. I smelled a fart as she passed by the second time. I waited. It seemed like a long time. I took off my hoodie. The Amazon looked at me and smiled. At least three times before I was called in, I told her about my misadventures. When I did, she laughed, not giggled, or slightly chuckled. She f was fucking laughing. Is that okay? Should I be worried? I told her about how I didn't know what she looked like. I tried to make more eye contact. I looked at her more. I can only remember a few things about her. She had on these black shoes. They had a crisscross leather strap. As I spilled my guts, I was constantly thinking about how much those shoes cost. My guess was under $20. The pants, I can't remember, but they looked dark. So my guess, thinking back on it, is that they were typical black dress pants, kind of stretchy. They too were under $20. The top I can't remember, but I did notice a couple other things. She had on a wedding band, so there is a Mr. Therapist somewhere. I did like how she had shaped her left eyebrow. It was nicely done. And although it was thin as far as hair goes, the penciling or brushing done with the makeup was not over the top. I think there was some facial piercings, but I cannot recall. That was about as much as I could look at her. I noticed that the dollhouse that was in front of me, the door that had looked broken, it was red. It looked like a mailbox. It looked like it was leaning against the house, not a part of it. There was one figure that was beat to shit. It was on the ground in front of it, ragged. That upset me somehow. I couldn't stop looking at it. I told her how much wine I'd be drinking when she asked about my self-care. She said she would have to keep an eye on that. That irritated me. She told me not to quit smoking yet, not to use the patches, because a side effect is suicide. I was looking forward to the vivid dreams. Oh well. I made almost the whole way through, and then I cried. Massive tears that wouldn't stop, it seemed. I told her how I felt weird every time I saw a workman in their work trucks in the morning going to work. They'd probably been awake hours before me and had gotten a lot done. They were probably thinking about getting a case of beer after work, going home to their wives, talking about whose house they were going to this weekend coming up, what parties or games were on, what they were going to do, planning vacations, playing with the kids, being normal. I cried. I have always admired people who can do the 9 to 5 and be normal. I've never been able to understand it. I have wanted to, but I haven't been able to. She said that gives her a lot of insight. I said, good. Then I stopped. She was confused. She asked how I did that. Did what, I asked. Turn it off, she said. You just stopped. I was done. I needed to stop. There was only three minutes left of our time. I couldn't leave there crying. Whew. Memories.
black sheet. I was lying in bed. I had a sleeping bag over me. It was cold. It was dark. But just enough light to see coming from beyond my door. I thought I saw a shadow against the wall. I didn't know how a shadow could be there. There was no light shining on the wall. My windows were covered with tin foil. The shadow lifted its right arm, then moved towards the right, towards the window. The shadow was able to grab the corner of the tin foil that covered it. Pulled the tin foil down. Then my heart stopped when I saw what was outside my window looking in. The moon was bright and lit up the desert in a silver ash hue. Outside my window, I saw someone standing an inch from the glass, looking in, looking at me. They were covered by a black sheet, but I could see the shape of the skull beneath. I could see where the sheet was sucked in over the eye sockets of whoever it was. It's been a long time since I've seen him, but he's here now. I guess you can't run forever. The wisest man I ever met. Sleep would not come. Darkness did. A cold surrounded me. I wrapped up beneath the blanket, tossed and turned and groaned and drooled. It wasn't working. The sensation was unbearable. I thought for sure if I just put it out of my mind, slumber would follow. I wiggled around trying to find a spot that didn't make me feel like bugs were crawling on me. Things weren't biting me. Creatures were not burrowing inside of me. Nothing helped. I screamed to no one, at no one, for no reason other than my sanity, alone in the dark. I remembered something a wise man said to me when I was a young boy, staying at a friend's house overnight. His father came in the room at bedtime, and instead of saying goodnight, he said this, If you go to bed with an itchy butt, you'll wake up with stinky fingers. I sighed, got up out of bed, and walked into the bathroom in defeat. Therapy Session 3 I have to go to another session today, but never wrote about last week. I wasn't sure how I felt about last week. I cried a lot. I felt like I was getting somewhere, then she made me feel like it was bullshit. I don't know if it was intentional, but I turned it off. The tears stopped. It was weird. When I got there, I got there 15 minutes earlier than I normally do just so I would be able to use the toilet. I did. But as I did, she opened the door, and the patient before me came out. She was early. I panicked. I sat down in the lobby, and the patient stood next to me while I tried to Google Space Force. What the fuck was she doing? Was she spying on my research? I got up and ran outside and ran in my car, realized I wasn't going to leave. But I had another ten minutes or so before my appointment. Had a cigarette. Then saw the patient sitting on the curb, staring at me. I nervously walked back to the office, and on the way, a huge dog jumped up and barked. If I hadn't pissed fifteen minutes ago, I would have then. It was standing between two cars while its master smoked a cigarette. When I got to the door, my therapist opened it for me, and she said she was ready. She was still early. We went inside, and she rushed me through my thoughts, then apologized and said that therapy won't work if I'm not medicated. She was wrong thinking she could help. What the fuck was she talking about? Is this not helping? Is me spilling my guts, not killing myself, not helping? Jesus Christ, have I exhausted her expertise? She asked me if I was medicated, and I said no. She asked me about grounding exercises. I told her I tried. 
She asked me if I was a danger to myself or others. You always say no to that question if you want your freedom. Then she said, She can't do anything without my meds. That I need to be on meds. I think I needed them before the holidays, but now I feel fine with just riding and drinking every night. I don't see the psychiatrist until tomorrow, and he is the one who can give me the meds. But I have to see this woman again today, the one who said she couldn't help me. There was a holiday yesterday, so I couldn't cancel. But I still got the automated message confirming my appointment and informing me that if I don't go, I will still have to pay for it. How the hell does this work? How do things work? She cut her appointment short by 15 minutes, giggled, and showed me the door. I ran as fast as I could to my car. I wonder if she noticed. I'll find out today at 4, I guess. I'm sure therapy works for some people. That's just me talking here. All right, the girl with the butcher knife. Today I spoke to a woman who nearly 25 years ago tried to stab me in the face with a butcher knife. Today she is a grandmother. She is doing quite well. I'm very happy for her. You're probably wondering about the butcher knife, though. I should rewind. Alice called me. She asked if I wanted to come over. I did. When I walked through the door, I expected to see Alice, but I saw Jane. She had a mad look in her eyes, and she was showing a lot of teeth. I shut the door behind me, then I saw the huge knife in her hand. It gleamed with the same fury as her eyes, her teeth. She screamed out some sort of war cry, held the butcher knife above her head high, and came running towards me. I laughed at first, thinking it was a joke, but then she didn't slow down. She seemed to be racing towards me even faster, which was weird because this whole thing played out in slow motion. I considered my options quickly, very quickly. I moved my head to the left as she buried the knife a good three inches into the door. She was still screaming, her teeth chattering together, eyes of fire. I grabbed her wrist as she tried to pull the knife from the door. I tried to reason with her at a very loud volume. I shook her. She tried to bite me. I asked her if she was finished. Her teeth went away, her eyelids grew heavy, and she nodded. I let go of her wrists. She screamed and swung at me over and over again, fists connecting all over my head and my body. I grabbed her wrists once more and wrestled, wrestled her to the ground, sat on top of her, holding down. Are you fucking finished? I shouted. She lifted her head up, snapping her teeth at me, giggling, growling. I told her I wouldn't let her go if she was going to come at me again. She laughed. I shouted, Bitch, you are burning your bra right now. Come at me again and I'll deck you. I let go. She at least let me get up and walk towards the hallway before she leapt over the couch and tackled me. She wasn't fucking around. I yelled for Alice, the one who lived there. She had locked herself in her room once she, had, once she saw how bad Jane had become. Alice finally came out and helped me drag Jane into the bedroom. I tied her to the bedpost with socks and panties and a long skirt I found on the floor. She still snapped her jaws at me. She still laughed maniacally. I tried to tie a shirt around her head to gag her, but she almost bit my finger off and spit the gag out. What the fuck, I asked Alice. She came over after I phoned you. She's on acid or something. Ya think? I shouted sarcastically. Minutes later, Alice and myself were trying to bang in the bathroom for some reason. I don't know why that's where we ended up. I think it was because we were afraid that Jane would break loose and kill us. 
Oh, break loose and kill us while we were naked. We needed a door we could lock. We tried and we tried, but all we could hear over the sounds of our lips meeting were the mad cries from Jane tied to the bed down the dark hallway. I bent Alice over and tried to slide it in, but that thing was clamped shut. I tried slamming it in. Nothing. Shouting continued. Neighbors were probably thinking someone was being murdered. Someone was. My dick. I sighed. Alice and I said it at the same time. This isn't going to work, is it? We chuckled, sort of. Walked into the living room, sat on the couch with a couple of drinks. We tried to drown out Jane's madness with other women screaming nonsense on Jerry Springer. A while later, the cry subsided. Just groans, then nothing. Jane was finally sleeping it off. We looked at each other and smiled. It was going to be okay. Then Jerry was looking right at us, and he said, Take care of yourselves and each other. Everything was going to be okay. I lit a cigarette. There is no try. There was a family emergency today. Not for me, but for her. I drove the 30 plus minutes. I sat in the parking lot for another 20. I walked in and her receptionist said she tried to call me. What the fuck does that mean? She either did call me or she didn't. Like Yoda says, there is no try. There was no voicemail on my phone. She then told me that it would be another two weeks before I could come in again. What if my family has an emergency? Do I still get charged? By the TOS I do. Does that mean I get a freebie? Two freebies? I don't want to seem petty, but one does not try to call. One calls or they don't. I will try to keep it together for another two weeks. The Robot Life is so depressing and death so permanent. What is one to do? What is one to think? How does one go on? Pills, prescriptions, robotic feelings. That must be the only way. If I go that route once more, I will have to say goodbye to this. When they make me a robot, I cannot write like this. I cannot open my soul because I do not know my soul. I am not required to. My soul becomes a closed off hard drive full of data that will remain untouched. That is until my next break, my next episode, my next system failure. My dose will be upped, sometimes doubled, and in only three weeks' time, system override will be complete, and I could go on without tears, without emotion, without drive. I will once again be a soulless, robotic member of our great society with a half-smile and only these words to remember what it was like to live. The night I lost my wife. The doc put me on new meds. These were supposed to help me, help my paranoia, help my inability to sleep, calm me like a slow moving creek. An hour after taking it, I was stumbling. I couldn't stand up. I couldn't finish my cigarette. My head felt like it was surrounded by heavy cotton. It was closing in on me. I mumbled something to my wife, then I guess I fell over, came crashing down in a small space next to the bed in the trailer. I hit my ribs on something, cut my leg on something else, rolled my foot, and slammed my arm against the guitar case. I dreamt a man was trying to sell me Bibles. I couldn't understand. You can get Bibles free everywhere. My wife was slapping me during this, hard. 
I wasn't waking up. She thought I was dead. I mumbled a bunch, farted a bunch. They sounded wet. She was screaming at me to wake up. It smelled awful. She asked if I shit my pants. That woke me up. Oh my god, I'm sorry, I mumbled. I awkwardly rose to my feet and stumbled into the bathroom, expecting shit to be running down my leg. I checked my pants while holding myself up, but they were clean. I sighed and almost passed out again. I tried to shit to make sure that wouldn't happen again. My head was spinning. I was holding myself up on the sink. I pushed and I pushed. Nothing came out. Little farts. I tried to puke in the bathtub to get this horrible drug out of me. I couldn't do it. I scratched the back of my throat with my fingernail. Nothing. A lot of heaves. I guess I didn't shut the bathroom door when I was, and when I was wiping, the door swung open and my wife saw me, fucked up out of my mind, wiping my ass after she thought I had shit myself. I was terrified that I was dying. She made me a cup of coffee. I flushed, washed my hands, drank the coffee, and went to sleep. The next day, my wife wouldn't get out of bed, and she wept quietly every time I walked by the door. The gift. My wife gave me something last night. It wasn't something huge or something wrapped or something I could eat or drink, and it wasn't a piece of ass either. My wife gave me something last night that no woman had ever given me before. Not any girlfriends, not my mother, not my daughter. My wife gave me something last night that was so simple, so easy, I felt stupid when I cried. The gift my wife gave me was this. She said, if I get offended by something you write, that's my fault. No one has ever said that to me before. In the past, I was meant to feel shitty every time someone didn't like something I made. It was my fault. I was sick. I was trash. I was shit. How dare I? I was made to carry that guilt, carry their insecurities, be the pervert, be the dirty bum, be the murderer. My wife gave me something last night and freed me from that. I didn't know it could be done. I didn't know that weight would ever be lifted off my shoulders. I never even thought about it. I figured it was a hard fact, a constant. I never knew it was possible. I wept. I was free. The Greater Sin Organized religion. I'm not a fan. Those two words I don't think should ever go together. I think if someone has faith or religion, that is their business and should stay that way. I learned early on that the biggest problem with organized religion is right out of the Bible. Man is fallible. Men will fail. When you put men in charge of a religious group... It will always go to their head. How could it not? I was at church when I was in high school. The pastor was telling some story one Sunday about how his biggest sin was reading the newspaper while driving. God didn't want him to do it, so God made him not pay attention and get into a crash. He rear-ended some lady. Everyone applauded at the work of the Lord. What the hell is going on, I thought. It came out a little while later. He gave hepatitis to his wife. He got it from fucking prostitutes. He stepped down. And now you know, reading the newspaper is a bigger sin than fucking hookers. Two old friends. I talked to two guys today that I hadn't spoken with in a few years. In that time since we've last talked, they both have had heart problems and both have had surgery to extend their lives. Getting old is a cruel, heartless bitch. Broken teeth. My spit was purple from the wine, you see. My urine was quite clear, clearer than most times. I clenched my jaw again, felt the pain rush through my head. It had been horrible the last two days, rudder hell. 
The pain went from my chin, back behind my ear, up through my ear, nearly to the top of my head. Nerves shooting pain through my skull. I have TMJ. A few nights ago, I broke a tooth on a pretzel crisp. What a stupid fucking invention. Pretzels are already hard. Why make them crisp? Anyway, I broke my tooth because after I turned 40 a couple years ago, all the lead fillings in my teeth began to fall out. I didn't know if my teeth got bigger or if I had a shitty dentist when I was 16. Either way, my fillings have all fallen out and left these teeth with cavities in them or holes. And if I eat something too hard, they will break. Or when I'm grinding my teeth at night, I will crack them and they will break. That's usually what happens. This time, however, the pain has been horrible. I've been taking four Motrin and two Tylenol every three hours and it still kills. So on the worst day, I took all that and a muscle relaxer I found from when I broke my back. I drank whiskey, beer, seltzer, and wine. I also accidentally swallowed some mouthwash that was antiseptic because I heard of a rider who died from sepsis from a bad tooth. I got scared, didn't know what to do. While thinking, I swallowed the mouthwash. That night, last night, I was sick as a fucking dog. I was dry heaving in the bathroom trying to get everything to come up. Nothing worked. I felt like death's door was in front of me and that I was knocking hard. The only thing I could think to do was make some quesadillas. That worked. Some pepper jack on a tortilla. If you ever need to fuck off a good drunk, eat some quesadillas. The grease will fix you right up. Spiderweb. I had to piss. It was the middle of the night, early in the morning. I walked to the bathroom, walked through a spider web. Many across my legs, my arms, my face. I said, uh oh. I was vulnerable. I was naked. I froze, trying to feel anything crawling on me. I turned on the light, looked around. I was clean, but saw a big black spider near the ceiling. I grabbed a flip-flop and smashed it. There was so much stuff in that fucker, I wiped it on the doormat. Then I saw a smaller black spider above the sink. I smashed it with a pack of smokes. I was too worked up to go back to sleep. I saw my slimper, slippers and stomped on them in case there was one inside. I put them on, had a cigarette, felt something crawling up my leg, and I looked down and a big black spider, bigger than the first, was running circles around my leg, my ankle. I stomped my foot down and it fell on the floor and I stepped on it and dragged my foot and lifted it up and the fucker was still alive and walking and crawling. I stomped my foot down many more times, dragged my foot over the carpet, dragged my foot on there, rolled black body pieces. Haven't slept. It's been hours. Fully dressed. Still feel them crawling all over me. My arms, my legs, my face. I saw three flies outside. Fuck. Luck. Like the cockroaches in the walls, I hide. I won't come out until it's dark. When I do... I will eat and destroy all things, then stealthily crawl back behind the baseboards of my life. For over 20 years, I have remained hidden. I have painted on the face of a clown. The happiness that I have expressed is usually a show, but most will tell you that they have never seen me happy anyway. Few things have made me smile real over the many years. And for those things, I am grateful. But those things are mine, and I keep them close to me and don't want others to see them. They are mine, and no one can take them from me. I used to look on the bright side. I would say, at least I'm not dead. But is that really worse? I used to think of myself as lucky, lucky to be alive. But am I? When you compare yourself to others, which you shouldn't do for your own sanity, but when you do, 
things get put into perspective. You can gauge your deeds, gauge your riches or lack thereof, gauge your luck. At least I'm not dead. Audience. There's no audience. Why am I doing this? I've taken some pills. I've had some wine, a few glasses. I smoke up the extractor fan. I could barely stand up. I rest my head against the oven hood. I press hard against it, against the metal corner. I juice my forehead on it. I slowly lift my head up and I could feel the skin ripping. Blood trickles down, collecting in my brow. But why? There is no audience, no one to see, no one to care. Why am I bleeding? Why did I cut myself? Who is the target, the target audience? I guess it's just my wife who hasn't noticed it yet. When she does, she'll verbally kick my ass. This audience doesn't appreciate me spilling my blood. Spring in January. Angry scissors snip behind my ear, held by my wife. She too could be angry. I can't tell. She's cutting my hair and my beard so I don't look like a homeless prospector. She takes 15 years off of me with the hair. It's the end of January and I feel that spring is already here. We haven't had flies in months, but I saw a big one today. There haven't been any fire ants for months. Saw a ton of them building their entrance. The only thing that didn't take a break in the winter were the bees. They still flew around, curious of me, my face, my beer, my coffee, not leaving me alone, stinging me, dying. I think our food scrap compost pile is giving nature the wrong idea. I think they think they could procreate a lot because there is food. Ground squirrels, wood rats... Jackrabbits, every other furry creature has been living off of it all year. There will be a population explosion. We will be overrun. They may be the end of us, but I look 15 years younger. One twenty nine twenty. I guess it's been four years to the day that my dad, my father, died. There has been some sentimental pap posted on social media from people who I didn't know even liked him. And those same people, I don't even know if he liked very much either. I guess when people are gone, it's easy to remember the way you want, rose-tinted lenses and all. I don't remember him that way, for the most part at least. I remember some horrible things. He used to beat my mom, he used to terrify my sister, he put my, nep my nephew through a door, just to name a few things. I've never cried for him, I've tried so many times, I've tried and tried. I thought I was dead inside when I couldn't. I cried over stupid things like commercials, sad songs, movies, strangers, but not my father. I know he loved me as much as a man like him could love his child, but that wasn't enough for me. I needed more. He didn't have it. He couldn't give it. Never tried or didn't want to. I'm not mad, just indifferent. Let people mourn if they need to mourn or need the social backpats. Even after four glasses of wine and feeling like I'm not human, I still can't find anything nice to say. Onward through the fog, Dad. Onward through the fog. <laughs> Kissing four and a half grand goodbye. We went and saw her today. It was like old times. We spoke just a few minutes before she began putting everything she had taken out back away. What did I say? How did I fuck this up? 
She told us how good we looked. We told her the same. We looked at pictures. We laughed. We spoke loudly. We whispered. We laughed some more. I realized that the deal wasn't happening. When we got up and left, she followed us to the door like we were saying goodbye forever. I thought she was going to cry. When we got in the car, I almost cried. That four and a half thousand wasn't coming home with us. We still had to pay $70 for dinner and drive home in the dark. Wish my dogs weren't barking. We just need to shut the fuck up just for a little bit. Something good to read. I used to think that anyone could write anything great. I never thought that it had to do with anything in particular. Lately, as I am older, I look at what people younger than me write, and also what people older than me write. It seems that the younger generations are writing about love loss that somehow was horribly abusive or becomes a rape of some kind. I don't understand it. I don't think every guy out there is a rapist. Other folks, older than me I should say, seem to write in a safety that I find both challenging and disgusting. They speak of nothing by using large words, painting a picture of utter nothingness that might roll well off the tongue. I picked up some poetry books, read through them, and it sounds like some high school angst bullshit. I picked up a book from a writer whose career spanned four decades, and it's soft. He wasn't always soft, but this was trite pap. Where the fuck is all the danger? Where is the realism in this escapism? There is nothing, nothing. We live in a society where everyone has to have the same opinion or they are unpersoned. This is ludicrous and complete crap. The few are the loudest, and the loudest are the fascists. They are the ones who scare everyone into thinking the same, doing the same, saying the same, being the same. This is all shit. Give me danger. Give me blood. Give me fucking. Give me murder. Give me depression. Give me suicide. Take these victims away. Throw them into a burning vat of self-pity and shit. We need to take the word, take these typed pages by the balls and kill them. Beat the masses with our written words. And let their souls rise from the ashes of crap and mediocrity, like a phoenix made out of feces and bone. Fucking hell, I just want something good to read. Oh shit, that's the end. So, let me do the thanks here. Um, for some reason, I thought there was more. Um, special thanks to the people who made this book possible. Cedar Marie, Bettina Friedman, Jeanette Schofield, Eric Bergstrom, Zane Kahn, Brittany Stallman, Jeff White, Sam Humphreys, Raj and Kath Humphreys, Joshua Taylor, Jeremy Miller, Gina Androli, Julia Scott, Gary Griffith, Jason Leisman, Jess, Adam Maddox, David Wardrop, Jim Ortiz, Debbie Kurtz, Christina Barker, Aaron Dil Dillman, Troy and Jody Fuqua, Shannon Gunn, Sean McMahon, Sharon Lottie, Mark Richardson, Jessica Carter, and John Shea. I can't believe I made it through everyone's name. And um, there is a picture of me. And I guess if I'm putting this up on YouTube, I will put that picture up if I have it by hand. Huh, wow, we're done. Well, anyway, thank you everyone who supported that project. And I'm sorry it took so long to get this audio rendition of... Um, the end of everything out there. So for more information, you could go to www.ihatematwall.com. And um, I hope you've enjoyed this program.